So good to see you this morning after a little bit of snow this week. You can uh, blame all of that on my wife back there. Remember, I told you, just blame it all on Pat because that is a desire and wish of her heart is to see more snow. Unfortunately, this week, I think I saw more salt on the road than I did snow. Uh, so I'm not sure how that can happen. But anyway, it did, and uh, how, wait, eight fogs in August, right? Eight fogs in August. How many snows does that make this week? Was it five? If you can actually count that one. <laughs> five. Some people on the West End got more than we did. Uh, but anyway, so it, it is, it's good to see. I know COVID is, is taking its toll, and we're still dealing with that, and a lot of folks out, um, either sick, some folks coming back, grateful <laughs> that you made it through it, and, um, but it's good to be here today with you. I want you to turn your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 16. We're taking this journey with God through the book of Acts, and it's an amazing journey, joining God on mission with Him in the book of Acts. So Acts chapter 16, the title of the message is Songs at midnight. And I love the way we started out, praising the name of the Lord. And that's exactly what they did here as you read what we're going to read here in just a second. We find here the Apostle Paul on another mission trip. This is number two, if you're counting. And this time with a different mission team. You remember that he and Barnabas fell out over John Mark, right? Um, and so Barnabas took John Mark to Cyprus and 
Paul chose Silas and the church at Antioch commissioned them to go on this second missionary journey, which happened around 50, 51 AD, about 20 years after Jesus' death, his resurrection, right? So we're moving on in time now when we go to Acts 16. Time is passing as you, as you look at it. They retrace their steps back through Lystra, Derby, Iconium, uh, where Paul was stoned, by the way, and encouraged and strengthened the churches and then picked up young Timothy, began to train and mentor him. And we're at the beginning of the chapter, chapter 16, if you're there and you're looking at it. And apparently Dr. Luke joined them at a place called Troas because from there on it's we, right? So Luke is now personally present with Paul, the physician who wrote the gospel in the book of Acts, and they end up in Philippi. So I want us to look at a few verses here before we pray and then move on into the message, but let's look at uh, chapter 16, verses 25 down through verse 34. Would you please stand in honor of the reading of God's word? The Bible says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. And when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Don't harm yourself, for we're all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas, And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And when he took them the same, he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. And then he brought them up into his house and set food before them and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this amazing story that we read in the pages of your book. But God, we pray that it wouldn't be something that was, that's left in the musty, dusty past, but Lord, it'd be alive and it'd be uh, pertinent to the way that we live our lives now, trying to walk with you like they did then. God, do a work in our day, we pray, to spread the good news in an explosive way, just like you did in those days. Do it now. Do it here. Do it with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Have you ever had God close a door? Have you ever had God close a door you know there's some apparent opportunity that you had out there in front of you it came along and you you wanted to take advantage of it for whatever reason God closed that door yeah me too (laughs) believe me I mean I've had that happen in my life but you know what I thank God for the closed doors in my life man am I glad that I didn't kick it down and try to go through it You know what I mean? Because with the benefit of holy hindsight, looking back, I can see that things would not have turned out so well if I'd busted down that door and kept on trying to go through. Um, And I've found that God always, always has something better. You know what I mean? He does. Well, that's what we have here in this passage. Paul and the mission team, they're on the front end of this mission trip. If you look at the beginning verses of this chapter, they'd hope to break new ground in the province of Asia. And um, they started into uh, Mysia, and that door was closed, right? The door was closed. They uh, thought, well, surely we can get into Bithynia, but that was shut tight as well. And so they came to the seaport city of Troas. They're on the Aegean Sea. It was kind of like 
you know, going to Atlanta Airport or DFW Airport, <laughs> you know, go, <laughs> flights going everywhere, right? This was Troas. It was kind of the travel hub. And so they just dropped their bags in the sand. They said, Lord, where do we go? Where do you want us to go? Because you're closing this door. You're closing that door. Where do you want us to go? So that brings us really to the first point in the outline here, and that is the proclamation of the gospel because God tells them, here's where I want you to go. And so they get this vision, Paul does, in the middle of the night of a man from Macedonia who says, come over and help us, right? Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen that vision, he knew he had the answer, right? And so they hopped a ship in Troas, sailed to Neapolis, and traveled up to Philippi, concluding, verse 10, look at it, that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so this is the first time that the gospel had reached Europe. Because, and you think about it, from there it spread all over Greece then to Italy, Rome, obviously, then on to Great Britain, and then to our own land here in America, and then obviously to the uttermost parts of the earth. And our roots spiritually go all the way back to this open door after the closed doors that God gave Paul and the mission team. Thank God that Paul didn't try to kick down that door into Asia, but that God opened the door to Europe, which brought the gospel here to you and to me. Amen? God knows best. He does in your life too. So don't kick the door down. (laughs) Let him open the door that's the one you're supposed to go through. Well, Philippi, just a little bit about the city, named after Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great, the guy who conquered the world, right? By the time he was 33 years old, he'd made it to India. But it was a strategic city. It was situated in the gap between the mountains running north and south and basically the interstate going east and west. It was a Roman colony, so a big part of the colony there at Philippi were retired military. You see, the Roman Empire, pretty smart. When these retired military guys, uh, they would give them land grants in places typically on the frontier, the edges of the empire where all the, you know, the crazy people were trying to, <laughs> in, in, you know, come into Rome and push in on the empire and try to conquer Uh, parts of the outskirts they put those retired military guys out there so that they could defend against that tax-free they gave them land got to live there tax-free so most of these guys were retired military in this town no doubt the jailer that we'll meet later probably retired military and so they had some seasoned veterans in place in case trouble happened so philippi was a roman city populated by roman citizens governed by roman law And maybe, I might mention this, the emperor at that time, Claudius, he'd already expelled the Jews out of of Rome. Maybe the city of Philippi did this. I don't know. Um, But we do know that Paul and the mission team got to Philippi, and they found out that there's no synagogue there. There's no synagogue. So Philippi, no small town like Lystra Derby and some of these other places Paul had been in, And so Paul was probably disappointed. Why? Because that was his strategy, right? Where did Paul go when he first started to do work in a city? Synagogue. He figured, hey, there's some God-fearing people there. I can start there with the gospel and we can get things going. But there was no synagogue there. So he had to go to plan B in a hurry. I mean, you believe God's in this thing or otherwise you wouldn't have made the trip. You get there and then nothing's the way you thought it would be. Ever happened to you? (laughs) You thought God was in something. God was leading you somewhere. God had opened a door for you to serve. And then boom, things just are not going the way you thought. Um, You know, you you prayed about it. God confirmed it. You made the decision to go for it. You did. Nothing was the way it was supposed to be. Does that mean you made a mistake? Not necessarily. Wait to see what God does in this town called Philippi. And Paul didn't give up easily. You see here that he, he found out that there was a prayer meeting that was going on by the river, right? Let's see if we go to that next slide there. There we go. On the Sabbath day, he went where he always went. He went to find a gathering of people who were worshiping God on God's day. 
and he finds this little group of Jewish ladies, maybe just God-fearing converts to Judaism. They're gathered for prayer, and that's all there is. But never despise small beginnings. It's amazing what God can do with a handful of people, what God could do through us. Amen? I mean, they're just a little group of Jewish ladies, and God did some amazing things here in, in, with this group. And it didn't phase Paul one bit. You know, he's, but he's used to going to the synagogue, used to speaking to multitudes, proven from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah, and he had either a riot or a revival or both by the time he left town, right? It was always exciting when Paul was there preaching the gospel. But here there's not even a group of Jewish men meeting. It's, it's a group of ladies, God-fearing ladies, having a prayer meeting by the river, and that's it. But sometimes that's all you need. Didn't Jesus say that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed? Tiny, insignificant looking, but man, at the end of the day, the birds can perch in it, in it and he said it'll take over and it'll be the biggest. And that's the way the kingdom of God is. It starts small, but then it prevails. It always does. And that's what happens here. Paul took advantage of what the Lord gave him. He didn't just get discouraged and walk away. Oh, it's just a group of ladies down there. It's not worth my time. Nope. He was faithful in sharing the gospel. And there was a woman there, as we read here in verses 13 and 14, by the name of Lydia. Obviously, Lydia was a businesswoman from Thyatira, and they produced that luxurious purple uh, garment she did. Like the, you remember the Roman senators had these white togas that they would wear into the Roman Senate, and they typically would have the fringes in purple. And that purple was taken from the dye that was created in the uh, throat and stomach area of a tiny little shellfish. And that was a valuable commodity back then. Now, the discount brand or the generic brand or the Walmart brand or whatever you want to call it was typically made from after they got that one drop of purple out of there, they would crush the shellfish and get whatever juices were left. And that was a generic brand. But Lydia, we read here in the scriptures, was on the high end of the retail business, okay? She had the, you know, really nice dye, the purple dye, and the really nice clothing according to what we uh, read here in the scriptures and she was obviously a marketing rep living there in Philippi and she was a big time businesswoman. how do we know that because you skip down to verse 15 she had her own home that she invited the whole church to meet in so she was big time okay big time businesswoman so interestingly here the Bible says and this is the only place we see this in the book of Acts the Bible says here that this seller of purple, worshiper of God, go to the next slide, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. That's the way it's got to be. God's got to open a heart, right, for it to happen, for us to be saved. That's what he did with Lydia, and she received the message. But the interesting part about Lydia is that Thyatira is actually in Asia. You know, time out, wait a minute, I thought Paul was forbidden to go share the gospel in Asia. That he had a closed door. So he ended up in Europe, Philippi, part of Europe, sharing the gospel there. <laughs> well, it's amazing. Uh, you know, God brought the two together on the banks of the river, and she was, of course, gloriously saved. So it wasn't a man from Macedonia. It was a woman from Asia who was the first convert in, in Europe. Kind of neat. <laughs> so Paul and his mission team, they continue to meet with folks out there by the river uh, in verse 16. And uh, as they were going to the place of prayer, one day they run into this psychic servant girl. That's lack of a better term. That's the best I could do. So things get kind of weird here as you read the Bible. Um, the Greek says that she had a python spirit, literally. Uh, so that referred to the mythical snake that guarded 
the oracle at Delphi. If you know anything about Greek uh, mythology, the oracle at Delphi was where the god Apollos would speak through that oracle. And Luke said that she had a spirit of divination or that she had the ability to supposedly predict the future, right? And so this servant girl was possessed by a demon, we read here later, who was able to speak through her voice box and make predictions. Now, consequently, she had this bankable talent. And there was a group of men who were managing her, and they were using her to make some big money. So God is at work down by the river. we got a revival going on, and so the devil is trying to stop what's going on down there, and he uses this psychic servant girl to do it. And verse 17 says that this girl followed him around, repeatedly saying over and over, according to the Greek. Look what, he, what she says. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Is that what your version says? Most versions say the way of salvation, right? Um, the CSB actually says a way of salvation, so I got it wrong on the screen, but most versions say the way. Now, they were, notice they were servants of God. This demon is saying some things that are kind of right. They were servants of God, but Paul didn't need the devil's promotion. This is obviously an attempt by Satan to link himself with, Satan, with Paul's missionary journey here and link it with the occult and therefore to embarrass and disgrace his efforts because of the unrighteous, unclean, and unholy association. You know, you mentioned uh, Lee Allen, Billy Graham Crusades. Interesting story. Several years ago, back in the day in the Billy Graham Crusades, um, he held one in Las Vegas. He went to Sin City, right? I mean, good place for the gospel, right? And just before the first night of the crusade, a young lady had taken a machete, put her hand down on the table, and hacked it off. No lie. Google it. You can still find a, a report about that today, okay? Hacked off her hand. Took more than 30 strokes to get her hand severed from her wrist. And when reporters asked her, why she had done this, she said, Jesus told me to do it. The association is then made. Do you get that? Do you see that? Look at the screen. That's what's going on here with Paul. The devil is making an association. That's what happened at the Billy Graham crusade. And, you know, it, it, it's amazing. He was attempting to embarrass the cause of Christ back in the days of Billy Graham and then all the way back to the days of Paul is still doing it today. And you'll find that where God is at work, Satan's going to show up and try to throw a wrench in it. I mean, he always does. So be careful that he doesn't use you to do his dirty work like he used that lady in the crusade. That's what happened. Now notice what this demon girl said, though. This, this demon through the girl said, because it doesn't sound all that bad. Um, they are telling you, a way to be saved is what the Greek says. Now, there's no definite article in there like it shows up on the screen. It doesn't say the way. It says a way to be saved. That's very subtle. You know, it's kind of the idea that, you know, as long as you're sincere, we're all headed to the same place. We're just taking different paths. Lots of ways to God. You ever heard that? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what they say today. That's what people will tell you. Lots of ways to God. No. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. Amen? <laughs> no, there's not a way to salvation except the way, and the way is Jesus. So after several years of, of uh, sorry, several days of her saying that over and over and over in the streets and in Paul's ear, he'd had enough of it. And so he turns around and casts 
out the spirit. He says, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. So Luke says that when the demon went out, if you go on to the next uh, scripture, <laughs> whoop, I went too far. There it is. Well, one more time. Nope. Back one. We're having fun now. Okay, 19, that's it. But when the owners saw that the hope for their gain was gone, so when the demon went out, the money went out too. <laughs> and it's the same Greek word for both. It's amazing. So it's kind of a play on words. I know, I'm a, I'm a nerd. I'm a Greek nerd. I can't help it. But when that demon went out, the money was gone too. And man, that's when the trouble hit, okay? Because you, you, you hit people in their pocketbook, they're going to come out at you. And that's exactly what happens here. Um, this girl couldn't tell the future anymore. She wasn't worth anything, these, guys, these handlers anymore. And so all of a sudden, Paul and Silas had worn out their welcome. And the, in fact, the, the girl's handlers were hot in verse 19. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews. Do you see that? And that really brings us to the next point, and that's the persecution of the gospel. And that's one's not on your outline. Sorry about that. Lynn always does a great job, and she, gave, she printed exactly what I gave her, but I added a point. Sorry. Uh, anyway, so the persecution of the gospel is about to hit here because of what they were doing. And they say they pull the J word, they pull the race card, and before you know it, they caused a riot, and the crowd became a mob, and this thing took a life of its own. And So they're victims of a race riot, brought it in on trumped-up charges, and sentenced to a beating, and then to jail. We go to the next slide there. So that's what happened to them. And they're in trouble. In this new city where God told them, this is where I want you to go. This is where the open door led. Right into trouble. Have you ever experienced anything like that? You just felt like, okay, I'm doing the will of God. I'm doing exactly what he told me to do. And it led you right into trouble. Ever happened? I mean, you know, I thought you were innocent till proven guilty in this country. But I was wrong on that one myself one time. When I was several years ago, drove into the gas station, crossing the mall. I think it's a Dunkin' Donuts now. Used to be an Exxon station. Y'all remember from the way back day when that was an Exxon across from the mall? Shows you how old I am. I drove in there, uh, was in a hurry, swapped my card, got gas. Power went off momentarily, so I didn't think anything about it. I didn't get a receipt, didn't think anything about that. Half the time I don't put paper in those things. And I drove off thinking, okay, I'm good. Well, a few minutes later, back in the day of flip phones, my mom called me. She has a friend, I won't name her name, incriminate her publicly, but she likes to listen to the police scanner. And guess whose name came across the police scanner. Yours truly. They mispronounced it, but it was still me. It didn't matter, you know. And so I got that message, and man, I went straight back to that Exxon station, marched myself into that office, and I said, you have no idea what this could do to my reputation as a pastor. At the time, I was pastor of Buffalo Trail Baptist Church. And uh, I said, I, all I got is my name, dude. I, I, and I, I tried to pay. And so I made them get on the phone with Exxon to make sure that I had indeed put my card in there and legit made a purchase. And sure enough, it was their mistake. But it's all it takes, isn't it? I mean, you, your reputation can be destroyed in a moment uh, by a false accusation. But anyway, that, that's, you know, th these guys were branded as Jews, labeled as troublemakers, and look at what they're saying about them. It says, you know, 
They, they attacked them and they tore their garments off of them, gave them orders to beat them with rods. And when they inflicted many blows on them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. So these, these magistrates situated in the northwest corner of the marketplace have sentenced them, beaten with rods. Now these Roman lictors would take long sticks and beat you to a pulp. According to the Roman system of punishment, there was no limit to the number of licks, lictor, <laughs> they could give you. They put a whooping on Paul and Silas. And based on what's said later, later in verse 33, uh, they got more than, you know, six licks, like that guy got caned in, in uh, the Philippines years ago. Do y'all remember that dude? Big national news about a guy getting hit with a cane six times. Probably got a lot more than that, but because when it speaks of their wounds in verse 33, the, the word refers to torn flesh. You ever heard it said, I'll tie 10 to hide off of you? You ever have anybody tell you that and then, then you, they commence to put a whooping on you? Nobody ever been whipped with a, with a hickory switch around here or a belt? Okay, all right, so you know what I'm talking about. Well, that was literally what they did to Paul and Silas. I mean, they ripped the hide off these guys. So they endured a brutal beating, and Paul never forgot it. In fact, he mentions it over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. First of three times this happened to him. Now, can you imagine? Here you are, trying to do God's will, trying to tell people how they can be saved and have eternal life with the Lord, and you're sharing the only a message of hope with them, which is Jesus Christ. And they say, thank you for be beating you with an inch of your life and throwing you in a dungeon. That's tough. Now, in a typical Roman prison, they had three levels. They had an outer level where the prisoners could get to the sunlight and some fresh air. They had an inner cell where some of the light filtered in. But then there was the dungeon. It was dark, damp, rats, squeaking, bugs crawling, no running water, no toilets. Filthy. And they put chains on your wrist, shackle around your neck, chain those to the wall, and often would put your feet in stocks and put it at bearing widths to increase your discomfort. Okay? So that's the picture of Paul and Silas in that dungeon. Now, can you imagine what it'd be like to be beaten with an inch of your life? Your body a bruised and bloody mess and in so much pain you wish you could just pass out so you wouldn't feel it anymore? And then they take you down there and put your hands and necks and chains and feet and stocks and lock you up in all that filth. And you didn't do one thing to deserve it. In fact, you were trying to help these people by pointing them to the Lord. Now, how would you feel about that? Be honest. I know how I'd feel about that. <laughs> it wouldn't be pretty what I'd be thinking or saying probably at that point. But I want you to notice the third thing, and that is the prayer of the gospel. Look at what they were doing, Paul and Silas. They were praying and sing, singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. So they've been beaten, chained, locked up, and they're praying to God. Now, what were they praying? Well, most of us would be praying, well, God, how can you say that you love me and let this happen to me? Am I right about it? Is that about what you'd be praying? That's what I'd be praying. I thought you led me to do this. Why, could you, why would you let this happen to me? Can't you take care of your servants any better than this? I mean, I can hear myself now. Y'all are too holy, though. I can tell. You're living a level of Christianity that's way over my head, okay? Uh, no. I, I think Paul was praying something like this. Heavenly Father, thank you for small beginnings. Thank you for leading us to Lydia. Thank you for saving her soul. Thank you for saving her household. And oh God, thank you for the power over that demon to, to set free that young girl who was trapped by that. And God, thank you that the sufferings of this present age are not worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. That's what Paul was praying. 
Yeah, he is on the level up here, okay? And I'm way down here, but I want to go and be there. Don't you? Wow, I can almost hear Silas praying. And Lord, we pray for these prisoners and, and for our jailer that they would come to know our wonderful Savior. So Paul, Paul and Silas, they weren't praying, Lord, get us out of this jail. They were praying, Lord, get the jailer out of his jail. He's in worse fix than we are. He needs to be saved, Lord. They weren't praying, Lord, get these chains off of us. They were praying, Lord, get these shackles of sin off these prisoners that are in the jail with us, Lord. Help them to be set free by your grace. I think they were interceding for that jailer and these prisoners. But they weren't only praying. Notice what else they were doing. Lee Allen, I know you love this. They were singing in that jail. Wow, singing hymns to God. Again, would you be praying and singing to God in these circumstances? I mean, most of us gripe and complain if the temperature's not right, the sound's not right, the light's not right, what, you know, whatever. I mean, we're complaining. <laughs> Sermon's too long. <laughs> too much money being spent on this or that or the other. Much less spend a night in jail, having been beaten half to death. Verse 25 says they were singing hymns to God. Isn't that amazing? What were they singing? I don't know. Maybe it was a new version of the doxology. Praise God from whom all beatings flow. Okay, I'll change that for the next time I preach this message. That was a bad joke. Um, but see, the point is we're ready to praise him when things are great, right? But we don't praise him when things go wrong. God, God knew where they were. He knew they were being mistreated. And yet it was still all a part of his overall plan to do something amazing. Paul and Silas knew that. And they were singing at midnight. Well, how can you sing at midnight? Let me give you a couple of three things. They're not on the screen, but... Anyway, first, you got to know that God puts you where you are. you got to realize that where you are, God puts you there. Wherever that is, however, however tough the situation is, God puts you there. God puts you where you are. In other words, you, you've got to get God's perspective on your circumstances and that somehow this is a part of his overarching plan. He's got a plan in this. And I need to know what it is, and you need to search for that. You know, the Bible says that God works all things together for good, but the Bible does not say that all things are good. Sometimes they're tough. Sometimes it's hard, right? And you got to realize that God put you where you are and that somehow through it all, it's going to be for your good and for his glory. Second, you got to know that you're doing what God told you to do. You need to know that. Now remember, Paul had some trial and error on the front end of this. Closed door, closed door. Okay, let's hang out and wait till he gives us a clear word here. You need to get a clear word from God. That's what they did. They were right in the middle of God's will. I mean, even here in the prison they were. Now, we're all going to go through tough times. We're all going to endure some hardships and difficulty. But let me tell you something. If you don't know whether you're doing what God told you to do, then you're going to have a lot of questions and a lot of pushback. So confirm and clarify God's will in your life. And if you, you, know, if you don't know if you're doing what God told you to do, you're not going to be able to sing at midnight. And here's the third thing. You've got to realize that God is able to see you through. You've got to know that your God is bigger than the dungeon. That your God is mightier than the mob. That your God is more majestic than these magistrates who think they're in charge. No, he is. And if it, and, 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 you know what? You've got to know that your God's big enough. If, if it had been his perfect will to keep you out of jail, he would have done it. But since it was his permissive will to allow you to be in jail, Paul... He can still get you out or help you endure. But you've got to know 
the your God is able. Now that you know that, you can sing at midnight, right? All right, so picture Paul, Silas, dark, dank, dismal prison, midnight, bloody bruised, have been beaten with rods, hurting all over, and yet they're praying while their prisoners are listening. I imagine Paul looked over at Silas and said, hey, I feel like singing. And they began to sing down in that dungeon at the midnight hour. And the rest of the prisoners can hardly believe their ears. They've heard cursing, but never praising. They've heard groaning, but never singing. And the Bible says that everybody was listening. Prisoners were listening. Jailer was listening. But best of all, our God was listening. Amen? And he said amen with an earthquake, right? Look at that, verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everybody's bonds were unfastened. And that brings us to that point of the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel. You say, well, man, what, what were Paul and Silas singing to see all that happening? I don't know, maybe it was jailhouse rock. Yeah, there you go. Bring him back, Elvis. Okay. But God shook that jail down to the foundations. Doors are open. Chains are loose. Prisoners are out of their cells. And you think you've got it bad. Think about the poor jailer at this point. I mean, he's in trouble, right? Look at what it says there. I mean, he, he woke up. He saw that all this was going on. And he drew his sword. And he was about to kill himself. I mean, you, you know, the, you got this bunch of prisoners you've been beaten on. Suddenly they're loose. The inmates are in charge of the asylum at this point. He thinks, oh, man, I'm in big trouble. He thought, well, all these guys are going to escape. I might as well kill myself. You need to know that according to Roman military history, Flavius Virginius Renatus tells us if you lost your charge, if you were in charge of somebody and you were supposed to look after them and you lost your charge, then they would burn you alive on top of your shield, sword, clothes, and effects. So remember that's that Herod Agrippa, he took out 16 guys that were in charge of guarding Simon Peter. Remember Simon Peter in Acts 12 escaped. He killed all 16. This is how he killed them. Burned them alive. And he thought, man, if that's what's going to happen to me, I'll just take my own sword and do it myself in. But Paul says, ho, whoa, whoa, don't do that. Don't do it. You know what I would have said after that dude beat on me? Go ahead. <laughs> Maybe let me help you. No, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but no, they, don't do that. We're all here, right? You see, not just Paul and Silas stayed in that jail. We're given to believe from reading the scripture here that not one of them escaped. Why? They were seeing God at work. In power. And they realized it. And so this jailer, he goes down to the, into the dungeon there. On that next slide, he calls for lights, rushes in, falls down in front of Paul and Silas. And with desperation, says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Hmm. Isn't that great? You know why more people don't ask us that question? Because so few believers are singing at midnight. When we're going through those dark hours, we're not singing, griping, complaining, whining, right? If, if more unbelievers saw us singing at midnight we would hear more people asking us what can I do to get in on that that's either an amen or an oh me or help me Lord at that point I don't know whatever you want to say in response but it's true isn't it I mean how much are you willing to endure for the cause of Christ how much are you willing to sacrifice for the cause of Christ? How much pain are you willing to suffer for the cause of Christ? 
quite honestly, for most of us, it ain't, it ain't much. I, I, I mean, we, we think we've done God a wild favor by enduring the long and arduous journey to the church house to sit for a couple of hours on a padded pew. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we think we've really done something big by doing that. No, 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 no. I mean, these guys have been beaten half to death, thrown in a dungeon, chained to the walls, locked in stocks, but they were singing praises to God. And it made such an impression on this jailer. He said, I want what you got. What would it take for you to live a life like that this week? Only Jesus can give you that kind of a song. I mean, the devil can give you a song when everything's going great, can he? But only Jesus can give you a song in the darkest night. He gives us joy that the world doesn't give, but the world can't take away. What must I do to be saved? And then the answer, it's simple, dude, simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved and your household. Now, how, how do we know this wasn't a foxhole conversion? Because what it says next, let me move to that next slide there. Look what this guy did. He, he was baptized. If you're truly saved, you're going to want to be baptized. Baptism is not a condition for salvation, but it sure is a sign and a symbol of it, right? But he did something else. Took him home, fed him, rough, rugged Roman jailer, washed, dressed their wounds. He was a changed man. So much so that even his family said, we want what you got too. That's the power of the gospel. Man, what a ride, this chapter. What a ride. I mean, start out in Troas, travel 170 miles to Philippi. God gets things going on with a little group of ladies on a riverbank in a prayer meeting. Then things really take off. When the devil tried to stop the revival, he couldn't stop it. It just changed locations to a jail. <laughs> And the revival meeting moved over to the jailhouse. Why? Because Paul and Silas were walking in step with the Spirit of God. And what the devil was trying to do to hurt them was only God's plan to get the gospel to that jailer and those jailbirds and set them free. <laughs> so a church was born in Philippi. One of the greatest churches in all the New Testament. When you read the book of Philippians, you don't read that about who was in it to begin with. You read Paul's lofty words about rejoice in the Lord and say again, rejoice. But man, you had Lydia, this successful businesswoman, this formerly demon-possessed psychic, a jailer, and a bunch of jailbirds. <laughs> I mean, you can't make it up, right? Right? We couldn't put that mix together, but God can, and it's amazing to see. But again, Paul and that mission team, they were sensitive to the Spirit of God and his leading. They refused to force their way through a closed door, and they waited on God. And because they did, God forever changed the course of history. When that mission team crossed over from Asia to Europe, east to west, the direction of the gospel went from Philippi to Athens to Rome to ancient Gaul, Europe, across the channel to England and from England to America and to me and to you. Their sensitivity to the Spirit and obedience to God changed the course of history forever and even touches your life today. Man, our God is an awesome God. Amen? And when you find yourself in a crossroads, when you encounter a closed door, wait on the Spirit of God to guide you. And when you find yourself in the darkest of dungeons, learn to praise Him. Learn to sing in the midnight hour. 
so that a watching world will be drawn to our Jesus. Let's bow together. You know, the message is still the same today that Paul shared with Lydia on the riverbank with that freshly delivered demon possessed girl with that jailer his family and with that bunch of jailbirds <laughs> in that jail believe in the Lord Jesus as Savior and submit to him as Lord and you can be saved if you've never done that maybe God brought you here today so he could do that in your life he wants you to be a part of his family so if you've never bowed your head and heart and prayed dear God I'm sorry for my sins and I trust Jesus and Jesus alone to save me and I want him to be Lord of my life why not do it now Father, I pray for those who need Jesus that they would simply trust him like Lydia did, like the servant girl apparently did, like the jailer evidently did, like I did, like a host of others here today have done and be saved. Lord, help us to praise you even in the most difficult times. And Lord, make us win some witnesses to a watching world that Jesus is the answer. He can set you free. And Lord, unleash the power of your gospel. Unleash it here. Unleash it with us. Unleash it through us with our community, we pray. In his mighty name. Amen.